Welcome back to Don't Breathe on Me. Today is May 29th. My name is Abram Hurt. And my name is Ezra Hurt. We're two brothers in Brownsburg, Indiana, staying at home for the most part and keeping our social distance. Today, we're continuing with the second part of our interview we had with Indiana State Senator John Crane on May 19th. Before we get started, we wanted to give a quick update over the coronavirus. Last Friday, most of Indiana started Phase 3 of the state's five-step reopening plan. This past week, Governor Eric Holcomb said he expects to announce when and how Indiana schools will reopen for the fall semester in the next few weeks. Indiana University campuses said they will be having both online and in-person classes next semester. The academic year will run from August 24th through May 9th, but in three parts and with no fall or spring breaks. The fall semester will start on August 24th and go through December 20th, but after Thanksgiving week, all classwork will move online until the end of the semester. The spring semester will begin online on January 18th, and in-person courses will begin February 8th and run through May 9th. Switching gears to something we'll discuss with Senator Crane, according to the Indiana Department of Workforce Development, The state unemployment rate now stands at 16.9%, which is greater than the 14.7% nationwide unemployment rate. Last Thursday, the U.S. Department of Labor said that 38.6 million people had filed for initial unemployment aid since mid-March. As of Thursday, over 33,000 Hoosiers have tested positive for the virus, and over 1,900 have died. From CDC data, over 1.69 million Americans have tested positive for the virus, and over 100,000 have lost their lives. Last week, we shared the first part of our interview with Indiana State Senator John Crane. We had the opportunity to get to know a little more about Senator Crane and also ask him some questions about the pandemic. This week, we'll share some of the more specific questions we asked about business and how the state responded to the pandemic. So, let's jump in the part two. Today we're continuing our conversation with Indiana State Senator John Crane. Senator Crane, this is one of our bigger questions but I think it would be interesting to hear from you. What do you think is the biggest economic impact or effect that will come or has come as a result of this pandemic locally? That is a great question. And that really pits, um, that, that gets to the heart of one of the biggest tensions in this whole pandemic discussion, right? On the one side, you've got the health issues and the other side, you've got the economic issues. And what makes this particularly difficult is on the health side, it isn't just like, well, you got sick a little bit and you were throwing up and then you recovered. It's that there are people actually dying. So as soon as you start talking about that, it goes to another level because of the permanency of death, right? Well, our tendency because of that permanency is to default in that direction. And we certainly want people to be healthy. And so on the, on the front end, right, the whole conversation was flattening the curve, giving our frontline healthcare workers the ability to be able to develop enough PPE, uh, ventilators to be able to have enough beds for folks that may have contracted this uh, virus so that they can manage that and flatten that curve. Well, at some point then, and I think that's where Um, A lot of folks recognize, okay, I'll do my part. I'm going to, you know, I will do what it takes. It's going to be tough, but we're in this together and so forth. At some point then, um, the temporary shutdown of businesses uh, became longer and got to a point where now we're beginning to see some of them are permanent, right? So um, businesses in Indianapolis, I just saw uh, an article of of a handful of businesses that have just said, look, it's been so devastating that we can't even open 
even if we wanted to. Uh, there's some businesses out in H Hendricks County here where uh, they've had to shut down because of it. And of course, businesses are working very hard to try to make whatever accommodations they can. Um, and my hope is that with things starting to reopen, that it's not too late and that uh, businesses can continue to move forward. Uh, but I, I'm seeing more and more discussions, both personally with uh, colleagues and leaders, but also kind of as I'm monitoring some of the online discussions where people are beginning to recognize that um, we may end up having a bigger negative impact on the economic side than we had on the health side. And it's not, it's not an us versus them, you know, that one of the things that frankly frustrates me, and I've got to guard against this attitude myself is, and it, you can pick your issue, it doesn't matter what it is, but uh, I've got my take on the issue and then they've got their take. And of course, my take is always right and their take is always wrong. No matter what the issue is and whatever position I take, I'm right, they're wrong. So um, there's a tendency, for example, on the economic versus health side. There are people saying, yeah, but health is really important. And the, economic, the folks that think economics are important, uh, don't understand what's going on, right? And then the people that think economics are important go, this is really important, and those on the health side don't understand <laughs> the implications of the economic side. And uh, let's just be honest, we all don't fully understand the implications of everything because we haven't been able to see it play out just yet. Let's also be honest and recognize that there is economic and health considerations that have to be taken into account. We can't just focus on one side or the other. And so what I'm working on and what I'm trying to encourage um, wherever I can, wherever I can have kind of have in, input with decision makers is to say, let's try to get things reopened as quick as we can. Um, I think one of the other things that I've started to talk a little bit about and try to push out there is we ought to consider flipping the strategy, which is, uh, moving from let's quarantine all the healthy to let's just quarantine the sick and let all the healthy um, recognize whatever risk they want to recognize and get out and live their life. And uh, if we've got enough uh, medical resources to be able to handle it and hospital beds and PPE and so forth, uh, then we should be able to address if there is another kind of spike in COVID infections. Um, because this whole, um, if you have a historical perspective, this may not be the first time, but it's one of the few times when we have taken the approach of let's just quarantine everybody who's healthy versus trying to isolate those who actually have contracted whatever the disease or virus or illness is. So um, there's a ways to go, but you're exactly right. The impact has been very, very significant and will continue to be. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think we've faced something that's insurmountable. I do think it's going to require a lot of perseverance, a lot of, of collaboration and cooperation. And I do think that we can come out of it, but we've got to keep pressing forward. Great. Thank you for that answer. Going more into this issue, do you think the state and even federal government is doing enough to support small businesses? Well, that's another great question because uh, there's there's two issues there, right? One is uh, federal and state having to work together, which um, there's always a tension if you understand the Constitution and the relationship between the role of federal government and the role of state government. Specifically, the Constitution talks about the fact that anything that's not specifically enumerated in the Constitution um, should be defaulted to the states because our founding fathers believed in authority, not from the top down, like a, a monarch, but actually from the bottom up, we the people. And so that entire philosophy is what's shaped the establishment of our governmental system. Well, that all sounds good in theory and in some constitutional document. The actual application of that can get pretty messy and uh, there's a lot of power struggles that happen between the feds and the, and, and the states. I would say generally, I think that the uh, approach has been collaborative. I think the feds and the states have worked pretty well together. I mean, 
there's some points of contention, you know, but generally speaking, I think there's been a good kind of team effort in that way um, in relation specifically to helping small businesses. I will tell you that some of the immediate action that the federal government took in passing some kind of what we might call stimulus packages to help um, businesses and nonprofits and any of these organizations be able to help cover some of their payroll and some of the other expenses that they have has been very, very helpful. It's not perfect. Um, the systems have become overloaded because there's a lot of people trying to, to uh, get some of that help. Um, the unemployment rate obviously has gone up. And so there's a lot of people that have been trying to get unemployment and that's overloaded the system. And so you, sometimes we have to separate the actual execution of the idea from the idea itself, right? The idea itself is we want to try to help small businesses in whatever way we can. Uh, the execution doesn't always happen as smoothly as we would all hope it, it might. And because of that, there's been some frustration. But I would say generally, um, they've done a lot. You know, whether they could do more, I think there's always more that could be done. Um, I think, frankly, at this point, one of the best things that could be done would be to actually get us uh, open sooner rather than later. And so as soon as we can get open, then folks can kind of get back into the trenches of working and, and pursuing uh, whatever it is that they're doing in the business space and uh, actually helping stimulate the economy through their own you know, hard work and effort and, and so forth versus actually just waiting for a another stimulus check from the government. So there's been a lot of talk about how our state has responded to this pandemic. I'm interested in maybe what some of your thoughts are on how the state has responded. And have you also been involved in any of the decision making that went into some of the stay at home orders and even reopening? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's one that uh, comes up quite a bit, as you might imagine. Um, there have been a lot of people that have reached out to me uh, asking for help, asking for input, asking to please pass this along to the governor. Uh, the reality is that even as a member of the legislature, um, I have not been in on the actual decision making. There have been points at which I've been able to kind of offer my two cents in terms of how we might approach different things. But uh, really at this point, everything's coming out as executive orders or executive guidelines. And so um, it's all coming from the governor's office and from his team. Um, the original, uh, the, the, the approach that he's taken comes out of the post 9-11 era, right? So when 9-11 happened, uh, there was a lot of this establishment of, uh, of emergency orders. And the intent was to give the executive maximum flexibility to be able to do what they need to do in an emergency, which I think is a, appropriate to a point. The danger becomes when you leverage that to then do things that other branches of government should be weighing in on. And I don't say that necessarily to criticize the governor from top to bottom. There might be some things that I would have done differently, but it's very easy, and this is probably one of the biggest things that I've learned in this role, and especially as a leader, it's very easy to uh, armchair quarterback from the outside and to say, well, if I was running the world, here's what we would do, <laughs> right? Um, it's, it's a challenge for any of us who have families to have to make decisions on behalf of our kids. I have four kids. Um, I, I am also the senator for a district that has at least 135 to 150,000 people that are looking for me and to me to represent them at the state house. I'm not the governor that has 6.8 million people in this state over which he's responsible. Now, that's not to justify anything. That's simply to be a little bit more generous in our critique. And uh, it's very easy and I think culturally, uh, we have defaulted as a people towards being quick to criticize, and um, I don't think that's always helpful. I, I always talk about, and one of the things that we teach in a lot of our leadership training is this idea of being thoughtful, which means we need to think well about the issues, but we also 
need to be kind and generous and thoughtful in terms of how we engage with one another. And so um, I do think maybe there are some things that could have been done differently, but the fact of the matter is, and, and I've had people weigh in and say, hey, do you think the governor should have done this or that? And I've tended to uh, not answer that question because it's, it's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, I didn't have any choice in the matter, and he made the decision already, and so we're now living under, for example, a shelter in place or whether we should have extended shelter in place two more weeks or not. It's like the decision has been made. Um, I do think it's important to offer our two cents, especially when – there's a there's a time frame in which that input could help affect decisions being made right now or in the future. And so in that respect, I have tried to weigh in where it has been appropriate to say, hey, can we kind of be thinking about this or this happened? One of the things that I have tried to do is just to share some potential problems that have come out of certain things and say, hey, this happened to some of my, cons my constituents here. I think this is problematic. I just want you guys to know at the executive level so that you and your team can, can handle it. And they have, everything that I've sent along to them, they have been very responsive to, and I've appreciated that. Um, but I know there's a lot of other people that, you know, we're all downstream of this decision or that decision. And oftentimes it can get pretty frustrating uh, because it's not playing out in a way that appears to be helpful to us. And so um, these kinds of situations are unprecedented. And as I've said often, there's no playbook. I can't just reach over and pull the book off the shelf and say, hey, here's what I should do in this situation. Uh, when the pandemic hits, here's, here's our next steps. And so what you're often doing as a leader in any capacity, in any context, is to try to get the best information you can, try to read the cues and clues of the landscape. Try to use your wisdom and your experience, and obviously you want to pray hard and trust that God's going to help uh, give you a download and cover the difference, and then you make the best decision you can make. That I'll leave you with this thought because I think this is absolutely critical, and I, I tell young leaders this all the time, and any leader, frankly. One of the first things you've got to do to be an effective leader is get to the point where you recognize that you're not going to please everybody all the time, and you can be okay with that. Because our natural default position as human beings is we want to be liked, and we want everybody else to like us. Um, the fact of the matter is I love my wife, and we are, we are perfect for each other. We don't always like each other every day, right? I know she doesn't always like me because of decisions that I make or things that I do or attitudes that I have. And, and you, you extrapolate that to a larger constituency the larger that constituency gets, and I don't care if you're a politician or you're a pastor or you're a coach or you're a whatever, nobody's going to like you all the time. And so once you recognize that, you can get to a point where it becomes less about trying to get everybody like you and more about just trying to do the right thing. Because once you do the right thing, somebody's not going to like it, but that's okay because they wouldn't like it anyway, right? So it at least for me, it doesn't make it easier because I want to be liked like everybody else, but it does make it better because then it just kind of frees me up to go, I'm going to try to figure out as best I can how to do the right thing and then make that decision and move forward with it. You touched on this a little bit already, but are you hearing from constituents? And if so, how are you hearing from them and what are you hearing? Yes, we are hearing regularly from constituents. I am either hearing directly through social media or <clears throat> some people have my phone number. They'll call, they'll text. Um, but most of the time it's through our office, which I encourage people. That's actually the best way to do it. Um, <clears throat> I don't mind giving out my cell number but because uh, I, I want to be accessible. But I've also discovered that with everything going on in my life, um, my best of intentions <laughs> gets lost in the busyness. So. Uh, just like we talked earlier about those someday projects, I have those someday voicemails and someday text messages that are getting bigger, right? Like, oh, I need to get back to them. So I tell people that the best thing they can do is actually reach out to me through my office. And uh, my staff is fantastic. They have done a great job. And uh, so we have had a number of people who reach out on any number of issues. Obviously, 
I would say 90 to 95 percent of the focus at this point has been COVID related in terms of trying to figure out all this stuff. And um, so they're working from home, I'm working from home, and we're just kind of in a virtual office arrangement that seems to have worked pretty well. I mean, it, it uh, we're getting good communication uh, back and forth with me and my team, but also more importantly, with myself, my team, and the constituents out there that have uh, questions or problems that we're trying to address for them. Going in a bit of a different focus, how have you seen yourself and your family grow during this pandemic? And what have you been doing to stay busy? <laughs> That's a great question, Ezra. Um, you know, it's interesting. I just read, I just wrote a piece for a group in Hendricks County called Men in Action. And uh, the whole focus of that organization is to be proactive in helping men be better husbands and fathers. And I was helpful in um, part of the team that helped establish that. And so they've got a monthly e-newsletter and they invited me to write a little piece for it. And the piece I wrote, I titled, I don't want to go back to normal. And the gist of that piece got exactly to the heart of what you're asking. And that is, what are the lessons that God is teaching me through the coronavirus? One of the biggest, there's many, and this isn't to, um, to minimize the pain and the disruption that has been caused by this. Uh, I have lost people through this coronavirus, and, and our organizations are struggling, you know, like many other people are. But in many respects, for me personally, I have seen it become a gift that God provided because it has given me, my wife, and our family a lot of concentrated time together. That doesn't mean we always love each other at every moment, right? Sometimes when you're on top of each other for that lengthy period of time, uh, tensions can rise. But we have had the best concentrated time as a family in as many years as I can remember, where we've been able to um, play out in our yard. We're blessed to have a little piece of property out here, uh, about six acres. Um, we play some games. We play basketball, volleyball. In fact, we made a point early on, you know, like, okay, let's try to incorporate some exercise and let's try to incorporate some time together that every day at four o'clock, uh, we're going to play a family basketball game together. And then we're going to play a game of volleyball together. And for the most part, uh, we've been able to, to keep to that schedule. Um, one of the other things we did, and this has now been about six weeks ago, uh, we had a couple days of gorgeous weather, and we set up a big old tarp on our property and, and ended up camping out that night together as a family and uh, built a nice little campfire and cooked dinner and laughed and hung out. And then the next day, got up and cooked breakfast and just hung out. And the reason why that particular experience was so significant is that we've been on this piece of property for about seven years. and uh, we moved here to be able to have a little more space. Um, one of the reasons we moved here is because at that time, my kids were younger and they wanted a dog. And I grew up in the country and I said, hey, it's not fair to the dog if you live in suburbia because they have to have a place to run around, you know? So when we get a piece of property, we'll get a dog. So we got the dog. But the other thing that I mentioned is, hey, this would be great. We could camp out and we can have all this fun. That time, about six weeks ago, of us camping out together as a family was the first time in seven years that we actually did what I had wanted to do. And it was great, but it was also a sobering reminder of kind of where life had gotten to where everything was going so fast all the time. And so that has been one of the things that has been very helpful to me is just to kind of slow down, even to stop on some things, not to have to feel guilty about saying, no, I can't go do this meeting, or I can't go do that speaking engagement, or I can't go here or go there, because everybody understands it, everybody's in the same boat, and everybody has given permission to everybody else to stay home, right? And so um, we have found that it's been very, very valuable for us. Uh, my hope would be, you know, once we kind of get back to whatever kind of open functioning looks like, that um, the lessons that we're learning and the lessons that I'm learning uh, will be actually life changing or life adjusting lessons going forward, that we won't look back 
five or 10 years from now, and we're back to going 120 miles an hour with our hair on fire and go, man, you remember that season when we were in the coronavirus shelter in place? Remember when we did this? Remember when we hung out and had those conversations around the dinner table? What happened, right? How did we get back to this craziness? Um, my hope is that my life before COVID uh, will not be exactly the same after COVID, that we'll still be doing a lot of good stuff, but that we'll be balanced and we'll be pacing ourselves at a, at a pace that is healthier and frankly is keeping our focus back on the things that matter most. And that's, that's what I've said to people. My, my hope is that God uses this great reset as a restorative reordering of the way things ought to be and the way he designed them to be. And so um, you got to be intentional about that. You can't just say, well, one of these days I'm going to start working out, right? You got to be intentional about actually putting the plan together. And so that's become our current conversation about what do we actually need to do to sustain the positive changes that have come out of this disruption that we want to incorporate in our lives going forward. I really appreciate that answer. And it kind of reminds me of a quote someone recently sent me. It said, just because things will be different doesn't mean they won't or can't be better. This is another question we've been asking everyone we interview. I think it's fair to say this pandemic has brought out a level of fear in everyone. I know I've had fears, but what are some fears that you've maybe had and how have you been handling those? Yeah, well, and, and um, that's, a, that's a great question. In fact, I just did a, a recorded teaching this morning and was raising that exact same question. What do we fear and, and how does that relate to our faith and so forth? <laughs> Excuse me, my, my approach would be twofold, right? Uh, for those that don't have a faith in God, they have the exact same fears that anybody else has. All of us have the same fears. We have fear for the safety and, and, and security of our families. We have fear for our health. We have fear for our jobs. We may even have fear for our education. We have fear for our family members especially those who might be more susceptible to COVID. We have any number of fears that are just part of life. And it's always a challenge to me that if you do not have faith in God, where do you look to try to get through those fears? You might look to your family, you might look to your bank account, but what if my bank account is empty? At some point, we hit rock bottom. And that's been the same for my own life, right? At some point, I'm going to work and I'm going to strive and I'm going to try to outsmart this thing or I'm going to try to make that strategic decision and I'm going to just work, 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 work. And if I work hard enough and if I'm smart enough, there's nothing I can't handle. Well, this COVID is uh, helping us recognize that much of life is way beyond our control. And so it's important for us to get to a point where we go, where is my hope? And that is, that is a universal question that every human being needs to ask and to answer. In what do I have my hope? And is it something that is lasting? And so I would say for all humans, that's the question. But then the answer for Christians is my hope is found in Christ. My hope is found in God. God is bigger than anything that I'm going to have to face. And I've been in similar situations in the past um, where I lost my job in the 08 uh, recession. And so I went for 13 months without steady employment at a time when our four kids were really, really little. And I didn't know what was coming. And the dark clouds of the storm had gathered. And here I am in the USS Crane. And we're hanging on, you know, as we're weathering the waves. And... Uh, you're sitting there trying to figure out how do we get through this? And that was the time at which God really got a hold of me and said, John, do you really trust me? Do you really believe that I own the cattle on a thousand hills and that there is nothing that you're going to have to handle that I'm not bigger than? And so to me, I think fear is okay. I don't think it's unbiblical or wrong to feel fear it's what do we do when we feel it? Where do we go? How do we try to solve it? And uh, the tension becomes, am I going to try to solve it in my own strength? Or am I going to lean into God? And God will use whatever means necessary to get our attention and to be able to 
draw our attention back to him. In fact, I'm reminded <clears throat> of a quote from a book here that says, pain often plays an important purpose in God's plan. Unfortunately, there is no other experience that equals its ability to grasp and to focus our attention. This is the same idea that C.S. Lewis talked about, that God uses pain as the megaphone to rouse our deaf ears, to get our attention. And ultimately, it's to get our attention to turn it towards him. And so uh, that really is my other big hope and prayer through all of this, that he will continue to build off of how he's helped me grow as a person and as a leader and as a Christian and as a husband and as a father, but that he'll also use this pandemic to help people work through their fears and hopefully allow their fears to point them towards the hope and healing that only comes through Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's some really good advice. This is another question we've been asking everyone. What are you looking forward to doing as things continue to reopen? And what do you miss most right now? I'll tell you one of the biggest is Covenant Sports. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I want to go back to restaurants. I was able to go back to one of my favorite restaurants, uh, Emmy's Pancake House in Avon. It's kind of the, the go-to place in Avon. And uh, we were able to go back there last Saturday um, I haven't actually been in BW3s yet. We've gotten a little carry out along the way, but um, there's a couple restaurants I'd like to go to. But honestly, one of the biggest things for me will be to get back to the sidelines and watch my kids play soccer and basketball and volleyball and all the things that uh, they play. Because um, aside from everything else that I'm doing, all of which I enjoy, um, I'm my wife and I have both talked about the fact that that truly is one of the greatest experiences of our lives is to be able to sit there and kind of be in the moment and be their biggest cheerleader. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. I remember when I got sent home from college because of the pandemic. And one of the first things I said to my dad is this wouldn't be so bad if we had March Madness to watch. But sadly, we didn't have that. And I'm really looking forward to being able to watch some live sports again as well. So I'll actually be graduating from Franklin College on Saturday, and I was wondering what advice or counsel would you give to seniors who are graduating from college right now? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I, um, I've i been watching John Krasinski's Some Good News, and he just had the uh, graduation edition. And so he had uh, Oprah Winfrey on there. He had Steven Spielberg, a couple other John Stewart, I think, was on there, uh, serving in the role of like virtual mentors and, and commencement speakers. And uh, it was fascinating for me even to hear them give bits of advice. And, and I guess I would say to you and to all the seniors, um, it's okay to grieve the losses along the way. Um, sometimes we, we get down the road a piece, and I struggle from, with this from time to time where I'm looking at life through the lens of somebody who's in midlife and not remembering my own experience in high school and the things that were like really important at that time, that when you get to midlife, they're kind of settled back into a more proper perspective. And God gives us the opportunity to go through any number of seasons and the good and the bad are all part of it. And that's all part of the growth process. And so for folks in high school or college, um, it's okay to grieve the losses. It's okay to grieve not having an in-person graduation ceremony, right? Uh, it's okay if you were the commencement speaker to grieve the fact that you didn't give a chance, you don't have a chance, especially after you pulled so many all-nighters to get that GPA, you know. Um, it's okay to grieve the fact that you didn't realize that your last day of class when it was time to go home was actually your last day of your class and your career at this institution. So the point being, it's okay to grieve. But the other thing I would say is, and it's we may have mentioned it earlier, that yes, we're in the middle of some storm clouds and some choppy waters, and everybody's kind of strapped in and they're pulling on the oars on their side of the boat, not sure exactly where we're headed, not sure exactly if the captain of the ship is knows what he or she is doing you know i'm just told to keep rowing um 
but we don't always remember that the sun is still shining, that it's, it's still on the other side of the clouds. And there will come a day, and it will be sooner than later, when those clouds will part and the sun will shine through. It will happen. And, and what I mean by that analogy is there will come a day when you do, you know, graduate and when you do get that job and when you do get your own place and you find the, 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 the person of your dreams and you end up getting married and you have kids and you get on to those next seasons of life, those days will come, that sun will shine. Um, I think the last thing I would tell folks is um, this is a warm up to life. I hate to say that, but it really is, because uh, there is much more uncertainty in life than we fully recognize, right? Every day is a gift. Every day I climb in the car and I can drive from point A to point B, and then from point B back to home to point A without getting in an accident or ending up in the hospital is a gift. I don't think about it that way all the time because I just climb in and off I go. But every day is a gift. The good and the bad. And it's in the most difficult seasons of life, at least in my experience, where I have always learned the most. And so that goes back to like, what is it that God's trying to teach us through all this? And so my final thought would be this idea of when you recognize that, you know, disruption is going to happen, and this is kind of a, a warm up and a precursor to getting out into the real world, then you can begin to go, okay, number one, how do I persevere, right? How do I lean into God, keep pressing forward, keep being faithful to do the things that I can do and so forth? How do I persevere? But secondly, how do I leverage this towards positive disruption, this idea of positive disruption? How do I leverage this in a way where actually great good could come out of it? And I'll give you one example. Um, there's been some changes that need, have needed to happen in a couple of the organizations or programs that I've been running. And they've needed to happen for a long time. It's just, uh, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings, or you feel like, ah, uh, we've always done it this way. Or, Well, guess what? The coronavirus is a great time to go, you know what? Everything's disrupted. We're just going to do some spring cleaning, and we're going to make some of the changes that we've needed to make for a long time. So the wisest leaders, the ones that are kind of those visionary leaders that can see beyond the next horizon and can see beyond the storm clouds, are the ones that play the long game and end up going, all right, here we are. And thank the good Lord we're alive and we're still able to row, you know, but uh, let's try to figure out how we maximize this opportunity in a way that can bring even more good into the world. Once we get on the other side and, and that ray of sunshine shines through. Thank you. I really like that answer. Um, this is the last question we have to ask, but you talked about some of the someday projects we like to have but never get around to last week. And Ezra and I have been doing a lot of reading that we should have already been doing. And we're curious if you have any book recommendations for someone wanting to read about leadership. Well, uh, that is a tough question to answer because there's so many books out there that we pr probably do a whole podcast on any number of books. I would say... Uh, couple key books that I would hone in on. <clears throat> One is um, A.W. Tozer's Knowledge of the Holy. It's not one that I've read, uh, you know, in the last couple months, but it's one that I often will go back and reread. And it's not a very big book. In fact, um, it's a pretty small book, really, but it is a book that's focused on the, uh, the character of God, okay? And so the reason why that's significant is because the character of God really is the fundamental idea that shapes everything else about how you view life. If you understand who God is and what he's about, then that shapes everything else. So that's one that I always highly recommend. The other one that I highly recommend is by a guy named James Emery White, and it is called A Mind for God. He's also written a book called Serious Times. And anything by James Emery White's really good. Uh, mind for God is focused on how do we leverage the mind that God's given us to be able to think God's thoughts after him, to be able to understand what's happening in the culture, to be able to understand our role in the culture and so forth. So those would be two that I would highly recommend. I would also say that um, 
anything written by John Maxwell, he's kind of a leadership guru. He's not just really good on leadership principles, but he's a former pastor, and he's actually got some deep roots in Indiana. And so he understands the faith undercurrent of leadership, so he would be one that I would also highly recommend. Those are all the questions we have. We want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to talk with us. We really appreciate the chance to hear your thoughts on some issues that you have obviously thought through. Yeah, you bet. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to invite me and to talk about some of these things. And really, you guys are a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier, that idea of positive disruption, where you're not just kind of sitting around, but you say, hey, all right, let's start a podcast. Let's have some conversations with some people. And regardless of whether or not the initial general subject matter has to do with the COVID pandemic, I would highly encourage you to keep the podcast going and uh, love coming back sometime. But thank you all very much for the opportunity to be with you guys today. We'd like to thank Senator Crane again for the interview. We really appreciated hearing his thoughts. And we'd also like to thank him for his work with our state legislature. Again, if you have any thoughts, questions, or you would like us to try to talk to an individual, you can send us a message on our Facebook page. Don't breathe on me. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll continue to listen to our future shows.